أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته It's nice to be in front of all of you here today just to speak on a very important topic Women's rights in the religion of Islam is something that affects each and every one of our lives either directly or indirectly so I think it's important that we had a discussion about it It's a book written by Ayatollah Mutahhari and uh, I just thought before we go into the book, it'd be wise enough to mention and have a brief introduction about Ayatollah Mutahhari. And so I'll, uh, I'll start by saying that uh, Ayatollah Mutahhari is, uh, is, as we can see here, that's him, his personality, he's someone of great status. Born in 1920 at the, and at the age of 12, studied for five years in Mashhad. At the age of 17, he proceeded to Qom, where he studied for another 15 years. And he had, his teachers were great individuals, the likes of Allama Muhammad Hussein Tabatabai and Imam Khomeini. So this just comes to show us that the, the author is of great personality and of great character and great knowledge. There's a lot that can be said about the author, but that is not the topic for today. But I found an interesting video on YouTube that gives a small story about Ayatollah Mutahhari and uh, the greatness that he had reached and the status he had reached in the religion of Islam. And I just thought I'd share it with you. They did not find death at the end. Rather, they found death as just a movement towards another world. You will find someone like Mutahhari. How great was Mutahhari? That his books are around the world today. That when he died, Imam Khomeini stated, Mutawal Tahari was the fruit of my life. What honor could you want other than Imam Khomeini saying, You are the fruit of his life? That means that everything he taught was instilled into Mutawal Tahari. Mutawal Tahari died in 1979. Let me tell you a story about the level he has reached that makes you understand what a successful person is. Mu'tala Bahari, before there was what he would do, he would sleep at 10 o'clock in the evening. And he would wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Every day, his wife narrates, this was his routine. He'd go to sleep at 10, wake up at 3. When he wakes up at 3, he would pray for a day. And then after that, he would pray for the Fajr. And then he would continue to do his studies until the next day. In the evening, he'd be back asleep again. He said, one night, I woke up, and I saw him looking outside the window at midnight. She said, in all our years together, he had never woken up at midnight. Always, 10 to 3, 10 to 3, 10 to 3. This time, at midnight, what's about God is awake. She says, I'm wondering, why is he awake at midnight? So she says, I looked at him, and I said, my husband, how come you are awake now? Never have you woken up at this time. He said, I had the strangest dream. What dream did you see? He said, we were in the Prophet's mosque, me and Imam Khomeini. We were sitting down in the Prophet's mosque, and the Prophet called me over. When Imam Khomeini stood up, he said to him, Imam, you wait, but what am I, you come with me. He said, I'm not doing it. Why would Rasulullah call me over? What have I done? His wife says, the next day, Muhammad Bahari was assassinated. And you notice that before his assassination, before his martyrdom, Rasulullah is the one who is advised him towards where he's going. So we've realized that he's an individual of great personality and great character. But one, two more points to mention just before we continue and analyze the book is that during the studies of Ayatollah Mutahari, um, he was faced with the, the challenge of communism and he realized that communism had a great impact towards the religion of Islam. And so one realizes that the books that Ayatollah Mutahari writes a lot of them have to do with the contemporary issues. He deals a lot with issues of day-to-day -day life. A few of the books that he's written are Sexual Ethics in Islam and the Western World, Hijab, the Islamic Modest Dress, Islam and Religious Pluralism, and Women and Her Rights. So the focus of our topic today will be Women and Her Rights. But before we continue, I realize that uh, I give a brief overview of how Ayatollah Mutahari seeks to dissect this topic and uh, he starts by giving an, uh, a brief introduction where he says the reasons why we talk about the western world is so that we about uh, women in islam is so that we can explain and uh, 
and uh, just to clarify the issues that the Western world had totally misunderstood about Islam. And he said he gives in seven points that he says were the main uh, issues that he focuses on in the book. And he says it's it's mostly to educate the media, which is constantly trying to portray a negative image of women in Islam. And he answers seven issues throughout the discussion. He says that uh, the Western is always proclaiming that Islam is a religion of the male sex, and that it doesn't recognize to be women. It doesn't recognize women to be full human beings, and that uh, it allows polygamy. It's given only men the right to divorce. It's fixed the share of inheritance of a female as half the share of a male. It has ordered the naming of a prize for a woman under the name of dowry. And lastly, he says it has made women dependent on men for maintenance instead of making her economically and socially independent. So these seven key questions is what Atullah Mutahari seeks to analyze throughout the discussion. But not only that, I realized, in my opinion, when I was reading the book, I realized that these seven key questions when Atullah Mutahari is answering them makes it look like it's just nothing but the icing on the cake. He, he analyzes Islamic rights, uh, women in Islam so deep that answering these questions is something very easy that he does towards the end of this, the discussion. So he moves forward and he, he starts the discussion by saying that uh, for us to understand women's rights in Islam, there's two key principles that we need to understand. The first of the points that we need to understand is we need to understand what is the sources of our rights. And secondly, what we need to understand is women in general. I know the latter may be a bit difficult, but he starts by off by saying that uh, the sources of our rights is uh, nature itself. And he says that, I'll explain briefly what nature is, just, for, just so that we can understand the topic well, well enough. Nature is something that is uh, installed or it's, something, it's a unique character or a unique uh, quality that's designed in a person or designed in something. For example, you see the nature of the plant is such that it grows in that way, or you see the nature of the dog is that it barks in that way, or you see the nature of the human being is such that it has two hands and two feet in most, in most cases. So that is something that is characterized by the designer. And to be very honest, each and every one of us will agree that the designer is the person who will understand an object more than anyone else. If, for example, I had to develop or design this laptop, I would be, of, I'd be having the most knowledge about this laptop. So it would be me best to set what rules should govern this laptop. And that's the argument that Ayatollah Mutahari says, that nature is what should be the source of our rights. And then he says that uh, you can't make the creator subject to the laws of the creation, it's just to make it in brief what he's trying to say. is that. The creator at the end of the day is above all other bodies and all other, all other laws. Islamic laws prevail over all other laws if you look at it in that way. Especially if you look at it in terms of nature. So this is the argument that Atullah Mutahari is putting forward. So then he moves forward and he says that uh, we need to establish a, a sort of difference in nature between the males and the females. So that we can understand the topic well enough. We need to understand that there's differences by nature between the men and the women. And he gives the most common examples and he says, for example, the menstrual cycle. For example, pregnancies and childbirth. And uh, there's one important one that I, that I found interesting to myself, that I looked up myself. And that is the muscle structure of the males and the females. I'm no... Uh, no major in biology or anything and uh, and so I wouldn't be best to talk about the muscle structure but very briefly I found this interesting and I just thought I'd put the whole thing in but it says men develop increased levels of testosterone resulting in increased muscle mass while women experience higher level of estrogen which results in less muscle and bone mass these factors equate to less absolute strength and muscle mass for women so what he's trying to say is that through nature itself, you realize that it's only women who go through childbirth and pregnancies and uh, you realize that through nature, women's muscle mass is also different. And then he concludes by saying that uh, these difficulties require the men to protect the women. I mean, it's obvious that during time of pregnancies and childbirth, the women experience such, uh, certain experiences that makes them weak. And it's, he says that it's the importance, it's the duty of the men to then take care and give support to the women. So he says that, uh, he said, what's interesting is he doesn't stop there. He says that this is also found to be the case within animals. And he says even in the nature of animals, Atullah Mutahari says that you find this concept similar in animals as in humans. And he says the male animals are always there to protect the female animals. I found that interesting. I said, let me look it up on YouTube. So I just typed in men, 
where men and animal taking care of female. And I found something interesting. I found a really interesting video that I'll share with you. But before I share it, I thought I'd explain two key principles before you understand the video. I myself come from Africa and I've, grew, I've grown up with the, with the wild animals. Not to say they're in my neighborhood. We live in houses and not in huts, by the way. But just to mention that when it comes to the animal kingdom and especially the lions, for those who are aware, you, you notice that it's usually the lioness that, that hunts and makes the kill, while the lion just waits and the lioness brings the food to the lion. But you realize that the hyenas live in such a way and they sustain themselves in such a way that they wait for the lioness to make the kill and they come in large numbers and they scare the lionesses away. So in order that the lioness fears the huge hyenas coming over and leaves the prey and the hyenas take over the animal. I'll show you a video that is interesting and uh, inshallah we'll just taking those two points into consideration you realize how the males protect the females. Frenzy calls filter across the bush in the keen ears of Intuagulela. He who greets with fire. He is the hyena killer. actually trying to protect the females from the hyenas and it's there's many videos you could search up on YouTube and they'll show you many examples of how the males protect the females but as the time just mentions that that's the role of the males is to protect the females and it's something in nature and then he continues and uh, he, he now tries to a analyze like women and uh, try to just understand women in general I just thought that was just it wasn't part of the book by the way just whoever <laughs> saw it and then he uh, he goes on to the next point that he mentions is uh, the reasons as to why the West uh, wanted to give women their rights. And uh, he mentions two key reasons for why the West started to give uh, women their rights in the early, in, in the early, in the, just for the past few centuries. And he gives two reasons. The first one he gives is the industrialists. What happened is uh, during the time that the West was uh, giving women their rights, it was the lobbying of the industrialists that really wanted women to be, have the opportunity to work. And with giving them the opportunity to work came the fact that they'll exploit cheap labor because women were being hired more cheaper than men. And therefore it, uh, it led to a situation where the industrialists benefited by uh, cheap labor. And then he gives another reason and he says uh, the other reason was the capitalist and he says that through the increase in uh, consumption through beauty exploitation. What he means by this is, I wanted to, I put a picture from the industrialists and women working in factories. I wanted to put a picture of the capitalists, but I didn't find a decent one enough, which is just to show us that the beauty of women in today's age is being exploited to such an extent that we even see, for example, in adverts, in perfume adverts, you see the nudity of the women and the men. And this is just so that it attracts the consumers in such a way that this leads to an increase in consumption. I mean, you see the handbags today, the adverts, and all that has to be, there has to be some nudity in it. And he says that this was to increase the consumption and to create awareness for it. And he gives these two reasons why the West wanted to give women their rights. And then he continues and he talks about the effects of these Western rights and the drawbacks that he brought to the, uh, to the women. And he said, uh, 
he gives the example that uh, women were made to work harder and uh, there was a fall in the honor and self-respect of women. We've seen the women who advertise in such nudity. I mean, it's, it's disrespectful to them to pose in such manners. But these are the effects that he, he, he mentions about, uh, about giving women their rights in the Western world. And he mentions another one is the increase in divorce rates. It's interesting to note that the same time that the women were being given their rights in the West, the same time the West was giving women the rights to own property. Something Islam gave women 1400 years ago, but the increase in divorce rate was because women were now forced to work harder and earn more money so that they could own property. And because of that, it led to a situation where women took family responsibility much lightly. They didn't want to be get into relationships where they could now uh, take care of uh, their husbands and children. So they thought it's better that we own, we earn an income and buy property. And who cares about marriage? So the increase in divorce rate was one of the reasons. I'll give a conclusion to this where Atullah Mutahhar he says a deep quote, which uh, I'm not going to explain very much. But he says the West intended to beautify her eyebrows, but deprived her of her eyesight. Which is just trying to say that he, he, the West has given women the temporary enjoyment of life, but at the end it's really not benefited her. And then he continues and uh, he turns to Islam. And uh, this, is, uh, this is where our topic will be. And uh, this is where he now starts to analyze the issue of uh, women's rights in Islam. And he starts by saying that uh, the religion of Islam doesn't view women to be unequal but the religion of Islam views men and women to be equal to one another but the only difference is that in Islam men and women are equal but not similar in nature we analyzed how women are different through nature through the menstrual cycle and the pregnancy and all these unique characteristics of the female are not in the men childbirth is not something you'd see in the men unless uh, there's something unnatural that they the scientists want to plan and do but naturally it's the women who give birth so he gives in and he says that men and women are equal in the religion of Islam but not similar. And uh, he explains this in two ways. He gives one example where he says that, uh, just to explain his uh, point, he says that to a mother, all her children are equal and she sees all her children equally. She doesn't say, I love this one more and I love this one less. But to the mother, she knows all her children are equal, but not similar. How many times have we heard, Muhammad, you've left the fridge open. Because she knows it's only Muhammad who's capable of doing that. Because she knows he's not similar. Everyone is different. So he's, he gives this example where he says they're equal, but not similar in nature. And then he gives the other example just to prove his point. And he says, uh, he gives a, a story of a father who is about to die. And he says, uh, the father has three assets. He has a commercial store. He has agriculture and uh, he has some property. And he has three sons at the same time. So he has three assets and he has three sons. So he tries to explain this concept of equality and similarity by saying that the father when about to die realizes that he has three sons so he wants to distribute his wealth equally. But he says he cannot distribute it, he cannot give each and every one of them the same thing. So it doesn't have to be the similar thing. But the father will distribute it in such a way where he feels that if I give for example Muhammad the agriculture, Muhammad is good in farming so he'll benefit most. If he says for example if I give uh, Hassan the commercial store, Hassan is someone who is business minded so it's going to be benefit Hassan more. And he says if I give for example Hussein the pro property, he's someone who is good in uh, property or commercial property and selling of property so he sees that the property will benefit uh, Hussein more. So he gives these three examples and he says so I give each son something that will benefit them most. and. Uh, what, what he's trying to relate is that the same way that this father has distributed his property equally but not similarly is the same way that Islam comes about and it says that men and women are equal but because we've analyzed that they have certain different unique characteristics within them is why we're not going to give them the same right but we're going to make them equal but they're not similar through nature and then he continues and uh, he says that uh, he says both men and women's rights correspond with their nature and there is no preferential treatment given to the men. And then he continues and to me this from this point onwards is literally the crux of the argument comes at this point. And Ayatollah Mutahari tries to analyze the status of a woman in Islam. My dear brothers and sisters, if we can understand these points that he mentions now, there's no way we could, any, any person could question women when it comes to the religion of Islam. And uh, I'll mention, a pre, uh, I'll mention uh, the pre-Islamic era very briefly before we go into the Islamic era and uh, the message of the, prophet, of the Prophet. 
I found this interesting video on YouTube again of uh, the pre-Islamic era and how women were being uh, treated prior to Islam and uh, inshallah we benefit from it. <laughs> Girls were burned alive. Women had no independence. They were not permitted to own property or inherit. Women had no rights to education, no choices in career, and no gender equality. Prophet Muhammad liberated women and brought rights to women which the West and Europe just recently introduced. Annie Besant, a prominent theosophist, orator, writer, and human rights activist, and support of the Irish and Indian self In her book, The Life and Teachings of Muhammad, she says, I often think that woman is more free in Islam than in Christianity. Woman is more protected by Islam than by the faith which preaches monogamy. In her Quran, the law about women is more just and liberal. It is only in the last 20 years that Christian England has recognized the right of women to property while Islam has allowed this right from all times. The Life of Teachings of Muhammad, 1932, page So we've seen that pre-Islamic era women were being buried alive. We saw that female babies were being buried alive. So eventually there'll be no women in society in most cases. And then we've analyzed that women had no rights to own property. And this was all pre-Islamic. There was no right to education for the women. And when the, the Prophet came up in the, the Islamic era and the message of the Prophet in Islam, had certain unique characteristics that protected the women. The first one being that women were now being protected by the Quran. We've heard the story where women were being buried alive, but when the Prophet came, he came with the message that said, female babies were no more to be buried alive. So we saw that the Quran itself came during a time that women were being buried alive, but the message of the Prophet came to protect the women in such a way that now girls are no more being buried alive. And this is through the Holy Quran. And then he gives him the other example, and he says the independence of choosing destiny. What he means by the independence of cho choosing destiny is prior to Islam, pre-Islamic era, women didn't have a choice when it came to who they were going to marry. The father would come up to the daughter and be like, next week you're getting married to this man you've never met. Just be ready and you're getting married. But Islam came to reform this and it said that women now had the choice to make their own decision when it came to marriage. And women were the ones who had the final say when it came to marriage. So whether, you, whether your father likes him or whether your father doesn't like him doesn't really matter. However, it's upon you at the end of the day to make the decision. But not only that, he gives an example and he says that Islam came to protect women even further than that. He, in his views, I know this dif differs with scholars, but in the eyes of Ayatollah Mutahari, he says that women were protected further by giving women and the, the opportunity that the father should give consent to the daughter before marriage. So he says that consent was something that protected the women and not really made the women more deprived of who she wanted to marry. And he gives a beautiful explanation and he says the reason for why consent was, uh, is something that uh, should be practiced in the religion when it comes to marriage is because in most cases he says women were being more emotional. So it led to a situation where the man would be more rational and the father would have more experience. So he would be more, he, he would understand the, the, what the main intentions of the of the person who wanted to marry his daughter was. And for that reason is why he says consent is something uh, that is of great importance. And then he moves on and he says the third reason being the social development. And uh, he gives uh, three reasons through this. He says uh, through education and uh, through... Uh, just, just a brief note before we go on. Uh, there's a book written by Anita Rai. For those interested, they could Google up Anita Wright. She's written great books and uh, she mentions the issue of education and she says, uh, she mentions a quote about a Ghanaian scholar and she says, when you teach a man, you teach an individual. But when you teach a woman, you teach a family, you teach a nation, you teach the world. I found that to be a really deep quote, just to show the women that education would be more helpful if the women got educated more than the men did. Not to say that the men shouldn't, but that's just to show that Women too should be educated and should have great careers in life as well. And then he talks about the he talks about the the issue of uh, uh, social so like social development and he gives he gives he gives a very nice uh, description of how the women 
and the men are protected in Islam through the Institute of Ijtihad. And he says that in, an in, in a situation where we're developing with the time and, and uh, we're changing and there's new development in life and women wanted to get into great careers that the prophets or the Aimas had never been into and uh, they, they didn't have an answer as to whether they could perform these tasks. He says that women have been protected in such a way that whatever they wanted to practice, if in a new time and day and age was something new in its own, he says that through the Institute of Ijtihad, women were protected. For example, women wanted to practice and become doctors. Let's say 10,000 years ago, women could not be doctors and uh, only men could be doctors. But then the Institute of Ijtihad comes and says that no, this isn't the case, that women can have such great careers. And he says this is the way how women were protected through the Institute of Ijtihad. So what he's trying to say is, for example, today you get married and your husband says, oh no, you can't become a doctor, haram. You, he can't say that because there's something, the Institute of Ijtihad says that you can do it. So the husband, what the husband says should be respected, no doubt, but it's, it, it's, the, there's still the possibility to debate and have a conversation with him as to the permissibility because the religion has permit, permitted it. So he says through this you have social development for the women and then uh, he said he gives the other one of uh, uh, he gives economic uh, economic what have I mentioned here? economic stability did I yeah and he says uh, in the Holy Quran he mentions that uh, he, uh, he, he mentions Surah An Nisa uh, verse number 32 and he says men have a portion of what they earn and women have a portion of what she has earned so what he's trying to say is that the Quran has also mentioned that women themselves can be part of the economic system and they are permitted in Islam to earn and have a career in work. There is no problem with the religion. But he mentions that uh, uh, women have been protected further to this by saying that it is the responsibility of the men to provide for the family. But the women be keeps her income for herself. Unless out of her goodwill, the women in the religion of Islam provide for the family. That's, that's no problem with it. The women can do that. But the religion of Islam has protected women to such an extent that it has said that women do not have to provide for, for the family financially. It's the responsibility of the men to provide financially. But if the women wanted to, there is no problem. So you end up realizing that the women of the, Islam is actually favoring the women by making them more wealthier than the men. However, that is just one of the points that he mentioned about economic development and then there is politic uh, political participation. And uh, we realize that the religion in the West, the rights for women to vote only came in the 17th, 18th century, not very long ago. But you realize in the Holy Quran, women had the right to vote 1400 years ago. So women had political participation. I'll just mention very briefly and we see the political participation, for example, of Sayyidah Zainab. We see the political participation of Fatima Zahra when it comes to speaking out because of Fadak. So we see that women were involved and they were speaking with great authorities at the time. So it doesn't mean that our women today should just stick into the house and have no political participation and no great careers and anything like that. That is not the case. And then he the fourth, the fifth, the fourth point that he mentions, I can't do justice to this point. I'll be very honest with you. The point on reaching proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This in my view, this is just my view and I'm, uh, you can feel free to uh, just refuse on it. But in my view, I realize that the religion of Islam has given women more rights and favored women more than its favored men. We'll see how... We, we, we'll, we'll, we'll all agree that the religion of Islam, at the end of the day, the final goal of each and every human being is that you reach proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the end of the day, all of us as human beings aim to achieve proximity to Allah. And he mentions this by, uh, by uh, I found a video that explains this. I couldn't do it justice. And I realized that this video by a very pronounced scholar just explains the whole situation of reaching proximity and reaching the favor and mercy of Allah. The women does it even before the men does. And inshallah, we'll, uh, we'll see this video just to explain it better. It's not me, it's the internet, just two minutes. نزلت المرأة في ملعب اليمين في هذا البحث أنا لا أستطيع أن أطيل عليك كثيرا ولكن أضرب لك أولا لابد أن تميز بين الأحكام الفقهية وبين منزلة المرأة 
عزيزي ليست الأحكام الفقهية مطلقا تدل على شرف الرجل بالنسبة إلى المرأة يعني أن الرجل يفوق المرأة شرفا وكمالا وتقوى و و و صريح القرآن الكريم كلما ذكر مراتب القرب الإلهي قال من ذكر أو أنثى أو قال إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم وأضرب لك في هذه الليلة مورد وأتأمل كثيرا أن التكليف يعد شرف للإنسان ويعد نقص للإنسان عندما يكلف الإنسان بتكليف إلهي هذا التشريف وامتياز تشريف وامتياز أن المرأة تمل تحصل على هذا التشريف والامتياز قبل أن يحصل عليها الرجل بست سنوات هي يعني أن المرأة في السنة التاسعة من عمرها تصل إلى مرتبة من العقل ومن الفهم ومن الإدراك تحيا حق لها أو تصل إلى مرتبة أن يخاطبها الحق سبحانه وتعالى يقول يا أيها الذين آمنوا والرجل واصل إلى هذه المرحلة بعد أن ذكر أو لم يصل لا لا بد أن ينتظر في الصف لسنوات ست بعد أن يصل إلى مقام ماذا؟ إلى مقام المرأة والأنثى حتى يخاطب يا أيها الذين آمنوا so we've seen how the status of women just on this point this to me that's why I said was the most fascinating point of all I mean at the end of the day we've realized that reaching proximity to Allah is the final goal but you realize that in the religion of Islam the women starts this even before the men does that is just to show that the women in Islam have been favored to such an extent that reaching proximity is given to them even before the men have done. Six years before. That's just to say six years. That is a long time. Imagine the amount of reward you can get in six years. And the woman is given this reward even before the men does. That is just one point. I'll move on to the fifth point, And that is to talk about the exemplary women in Islam who have achieved great statuses. This is just to show if the religion of Islam was really a religion that portrayed women to be of such low status, then we wouldn't have had examples of such exemplary women when it comes to the religion of Islam. I'll mention three so that I'm very brief onto it. And the first one that I want to mention is Khadija, the holy prophet of uh, the, the wife of the holy prophet. Khadija, I'll just mention one hadith of Khadija just to show you the status and the level of uh, importance Khadija has had to the religion of Islam. And we've all heard this ha hadith. I'm not going to mention it in Arabic, I'm not too fluent with it. But the hadith says that had it not been for the wealth of Khadija and the sword of Ali, the religion would not have had a firm establishment. Which is just to show you, from the very beginning of Islam, had it not been for the wealth of a woman, had it not been for a woman, the religion of Islam would not have been on a firm footing. This is just one of the exemplary women on Khadija. And then the second example I want to mention is Fatima al Zahra. Fatima al Zahra has reached such a level of, in the religion of Islam. Just one small thing to reflect about. And this is just to say that had it not been for Fatima al Zahra, the whole structure of Imama would not have been would not have been such an established structure. We realize that from the marriage of Ali and Fatima is how we get Hassan and Hussein. From Hassan and Hussein is how it continues to, to the other holy Imams until the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al Asr al Zaman. This is just to show you that. Had it not been for Fatima al Zahra, the whole structure of Imam would not have been there. And us as Muslims would have been lost undoubtedly. It's the Imams that have given us in path and have given us examples and have given us and clarified the religion to us. This is the second woman. On the third level, and this is the last woman that I'll mention, is Sayyidah Zainab. We realize that Sayyidah Zainab's character, you can, um, you, you, you'd need a lecture on its own to talk about. But just one important point about Sayyidah Zainab, and this is just to show you that the level of uh, the importance the women had when it came to establishing the religion of Islam. Sayyidah Zainab, had it not been for her, the message of Karbala would not have been alive with us today. The speeches and the spreading of the religion through her sermons was fundamental so that the message of Karbala would have been alive with us. So we see that had it not been for Khadija, Islam would not have been on a firm footing. Had it not been for Fatima al Zahra, Imama would not have been there. And then we realize had it not been for Sayyidah Zainab, the message of Karbala would not have been alive. Brothers and sisters, the lessons that we learn from Karbala is a lecture on its own. We, that's something we can talk about on its own. But this just to show us that women have had such great statuses. These are three individuals that we, we, know, uh, we, we know all of us are, are aware of. 
The other ones that he talks about is that in the Holy Quran, alongside every great man, the Quran is mentioned great women too. It's mentioned, for example, uh, uh, Maryam. It's mentioned, for example, uh, the wife of uh, uh, Moses and Jesus. It's mentioned uh, some. Uh, uh, it's mentioned some. Uh, and low, some unworthy women, for example, the wife of Lut, for example. So you realize that the Quran has also had a fair balance, not only as it mentioned great men, but the Quran has also mentioned great women at the same time. So this is the exemplary women point, and now I'll move forward to the point through which women were uh, able to secure two thirds of the faith of men. We realize that in the religion of Islam, there's a hadith of the Prophet that says that the faith of two thirds of a faith of a man is secured when he gets married. Brothers and sisters, if you just reflect upon this point, and it's not being for the women, how then would the men have been able to secure two-thirds of their faith? This is the status of a woman in, in, in Islam, where the faith of a man is secured through marriage and through a woman. This is just to show, this, this is the reason why I say this is the crux of the whole argument of women in Islam. And the last point that I'll mention is the status of a mother when it comes to the religion of Islam. My dear brothers and sisters, if the religion of Islam was such that it viewed women negatively and it favored men, it would not have placed heaven underneath the feet of a mother. Had it been that the religion of Islam favored the men, it would have said, oh people, heaven lies underneath the feet of a man, underneath the feet of a father. But he says, no, that heaven lies under the feet of a mother. This is just to show you that women and the status of a mother is greater when it comes to the religion of Islam. These are the points that I'd like to mention. What's important, brothers and sisters, from this point onwards, we've realized that uh, the sources of our rights is nature itself. We've realized that uh, through nature and through the Creator, He is, he is best to know what rights we need and what rights we don't need. And uh, we've realized that, uh, uh, that, that, the, source, that uh, the characteristics and the nature of men and women differ from each other. And then we've realized that the religion of Islam holds women to have very high statuses. And the conclusion to this is very simple. It's clear that women don't have any contemptuous view and they're not any defamer to men and they don't have any lower status to men. So the important question that now arises is, why then do the rights of men and women differ when it comes to Islam? And Ayatollah Mutahari gives two points. And he says, uh, the first one is uh, nature, and the second one is uh, to create a perfect family environment. I'll talk about the one on nature first. And he realizes, I mean, I, I, you know, when I took this topic, I thought that being maybe a low having some low background, I realized, you know, rights, rights could have, could make me understand it better. But I realized by the end of it that someone in the medical profession would understand this better than I would. I mean, when he talks about nature and the physical attributes of a woman and the characteristics of a woman, it's only someone who really is into, for example, biology that would understand it so well. So I couldn't really summarize this point and that's why you see the whole thing there. But just to say it very briefly, he says that, uh, in my, to make the scheme more practical and to ensure that uh, men and women's bodies uh, and souls fit into each other com comfortably, certain physical and spiritual disparities between them have been arranged. These very disparities attract men and women to each other. He gives a situation and he says, just, just imagine, for example, if women had the same physical features, the same temperament and the same habits as men had, it would not have been possible for her to attract men towards her. And then he says, in the same way as she does now, for example, in the same way that some physical attributes of the men attract the women, and some physical attributes of the women attract the men. But this is, just to say, that, that doesn't mean that you go out in the streets and uh, portray your attributes. That's not the point that he's trying to say, but he's just trying to say that it is because of this difference in nature through men and women that the rights have to be uh, dissimilar. And we'll, uh, the, the second point, when we've uh, explained the second point, you'll see how the first point actually comes into practice. But he says that uh, man has been created to dominate the world and women has been created to dominate men. I found that interesting in his point. His, he, his view is that women should uh, not really dominate men, but women should be the ones who, like, who should be the backbone to men. And should, if the man has to be the head, then women should be the neck to move the head. That's the kind of argument that I got through it. And then he says the other example through nature, he says uh, because of the less, of co less control in men, um, 
it's interesting you said this. I mean, the men will agree with this, well, whether they want to or not. But it's, in most cases, you realize that uh, it's usually the man who takes steps to win the heart of a woman. In most cases, he, it's the man who will approach the woman. Even, for example, in marriage, you, you see it's the man who now approaches the woman. You don't see a woman coming to a man and be like, uh, can you marry me? It's not really the case. And uh, what, what happens is that the woman takes steps through nature. It's the man who takes these steps to win the, to win the heart of a woman. And then he gives a, he, he, he answers the question on dowry where the West say is a prize of a woman. And he says that the religion of Islam doesn't view dowry to be a prize for a woman. But what it says is that dowry is a gift to the woman. And this gift is only so that it can win the heart of a woman. So he says that giving dowry in the religion of Islam is a gift to the woman. So that he, the woman's heart can be won through this gift. Women are... Uh, okay, I'll, I'll stop there. So it's, uh, and then he... He gives another reason and he says uh, that uh, the other reason for why uh, through nature uh, there is less self-control of the men is that uh, it's another reason to protect the women. And he said imagine a situation where the women were running around chasing men. So he says it's better that the men do the chasing around so that this can protect the chastity of a woman. So we realize that Allah has really not favored the men in any way and it's actually made the men run after the women and make themselves look cheaper. Not to say that men have been unfavored, uh, maybe there will be another lecture on that. But uh, this is just the two key points that he mentions on nature. And then he moves forward and he gives uh, another reason as to why the rights between men and women differ. And he says that uh, in the religion of Islam, women have been created in, in such a way that she provides peace and comfort to the family and to the husband. لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا So then you provide that peace and tranquility for the husband. So because the rights of men and women have to differ, it's only through that difference that they can be established a family relationship so that the responsibilities and the duties of the men are known and the responsibilities and the duties of the women are known. For example, we mentioned that economically it's the men who provides for the family and that the woman doesn't have to provide for the family but out of her goodwill she may. But the responsibility of a woman is such that she should provide peace and comfort to the husband. And then I'm, I'm going to show you a brief video which uh, explains the stress levels between men and women. Like I mentioned, a biology student would have done great justice to this topic. But I found an interesting uh, video on YouTube that talked about the... This is, a, this is a doctor who's written over 17 books and he's well known and he had some high uh, selling books. If you want later on for his references, you can come and speak to me. But he's, he's, he has this conversation and he talks about the different levels of stress between the men and the women. And I found this really interesting. I hope it loads quick. And uh, it's literally just three minutes to just to show you how the stress level in men and women differ through nature. And this is the way how Allah has created us. And you realize that through this difference is the only way that uh, uh, a family relationship can be established. And then when a woman, okay, I'll now, listen we have so much a sense of urgency, emergency, and this has a much bigger toll on women. When we look at the stress levels in women, uh, first of all, just the sense of uncertainty or urgency and emergency on a man can actually calm him if he has confidence. A woman could have confidence, but still her stress level go up much, much higher than a man. And then when a woman does experience stress, even the moderate stress of what women call feeling overwhelmed, they feel like there's not enough time to get everything done. Because there's so many more opportunities to do things. They overschedule things. And suddenly they're going, I have to do this. When you do a brain scan of a woman who's feeling overwhelmed versus a man who's also reporting moderate stress, they're both in the same similar situation and they both report to be moderately stressed. There's eight times more blood flow in the emotional part of the brain of a woman. And this goes to the hippocampus, which is the emotional memory. And it activates the memory of bad things in her life, or stressful things in her life, and it creates a sense of panic. Uh, if she's in a relationship with God, literally, when she's under modern stress, she experiences a kind of temporary amnesia where she forgets any good thing he's ever done. And she's suddenly remembering all the bad things or all the disappointments or the frustrations or she's anticipating bad things to happen. And this is what happens when women are in a world which is much more stressful than before. Their happiness levels have now dramatically gone down. And this has been reported by universities in the last 10 years where for, where for 50 years they've been doing tests showing that women were happier than men. Now women are showing to be less happy than men. 
uh, when his illnesses are on the rise as well. You can almost, you know, some of the old news was that the more educated a woman was or financially independent, the less chance she was of getting married or staying married. And that's absolutely true. But now what you have is the more educated a woman is, the more financially... So what you realize is that through the difference in stress levels, there's eight times more blood flow in the emotional part of her brain. There is less happiness in the woman. There's more, the woman is more prone to illnesses just because of this. Now, it's just, it's just a question that I want to pose, and it's, you don't have to answer, but it's just something to contemplate about. Just imagine a situation where, uh, where there's a perfect family relationship and the husband comes home and the wife is there to provide peace and comfort to him. Because we've analyzed and we've concluded that the responsibility of the men to provide for the family. And it's not really a must for the woman to provide for the family. Not to say that she shouldn't have a career. But the religion of Islam says that the woman should be there to provide peace and comfort to the husband. My question is very simply, imagine a situation that you come home, you're, you're tired and your wife is tired and both of you are tired and both of you have emotional breakdowns. Imagine that family environment. What would you do? Start throwing plates on the kids and shouting at the kids and there's just chaos in the house but imagine you come home and the husband has experienced a long day just imagine a situation where the wife is actually there to provide peace and comfort to him this is what creates a perfect family environment and then he gives uh, and uh, the other thing I want to no I won't, I won't mention that I'll just continue and uh, I'll go into he, he goes into the next step and he says that some of the root this is this to me is now the icing on the cake the seven questions that we mentioned in the beginning that Ayatollah Mutahari tries to answer. As we mentioned earlier on, a few of them we've answered already. Women is not viewed lesser in the religion of Islam. That women are equal to men in the religion of Islam, just that they are not similar. And then he answers a few of the questions that the West are always portraying to the, the religion of Islam. And he starts with the first one being inheritance. And he says, why is it that in the religion of Islam, the inheritance of a woman is half the inheritance of a man? And he gives two reasons for this. He says that uh, Dowry and maintenance being compulsory, naturally women's financial commitments have been reduced and men's burden, financial burden has been increased. And because we've established that the religion of Islam is a religion of equality, so that this financial burden and financial responsibility is shared, and because the man is to provide for the family and the man provides the dowry, the inheritance of a man has to be a bit more greater than the woman so that it can balance out. Do you understand what he's trying to say? Just so that there's a fair... Fair, this equity when it comes to the wealth distribution is why the inheritance of a man is higher because the, it's the man who pays for the maintenance of the woman, it's the man who pays for the, for the dowry of a woman. So he's answered the inheritance question and then he moves forward and he answers the question of divorce. This is interesting and uh, he says that the West have proclaimed that the religion of Islam has only given men the rights to divorce. Atullah Mutahari says that this is not the case and he says that a marriage is a contract between a male and a female. So he says when, before you get into the contract of marriage, you can set certain conditions and certain uh, rules into the contract. And you say for example that I as a woman want the right to seek divorce when, when, uh, when necessary. To be very honest, the reason for why Islam has actually permitted divorce is for the sake of the woman as well. Because it doesn't see it fair for the woman to suffer in a marriage. It realizes that if there is no solution, then divorce is the solution. Because the woman should not be under any suffering. So it's, it's given women that possibility to even seek divorce if necessary. Not to say that that's the best solution. I mean, divorce rates are skyrocketing and we shouldn't be part of it. And inshallah, God doesn't keep us into that situation. However, it's just to show that the contractual right of uh, dissolution of marriage can be given to a woman. And then he moves forward and uh, he talks about, uh, it's good the heading is hidden, but it's not really supposed to be the case. But it's a really, it's an issue that, uh, that's, it has much debate and uh, I see the men smiling. However, the, the issue of fixed time marriage in the religion of Islam. Ayatollah Mutahari deals with it because it's something that is part of the religion and he says that uh, he gives reasons as to why he, uh, he favors the issue of uh, fixed time marriages and he says that uh, in today's day and age it's reached such a, it's reached such a point that the, the burden of get, the, the, the getting married is seen more to be a financial burden than to be something sweet. He, he says that nowadays men want to be educated and they want to go through their careers and they want to reach such high levels that by the time they finish their education they're already 25. By the time they get a job, if they're lucky, it's already 27. So the cost of getting married when they don't even have a job is so high that 
the men are put away from it. I mean, today, for example, if a woman came up to you and said, I want a $2,000 ring, okay, I think that's a bit low, that's a bit normal, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, this is what I'm trying to say. If she wanted a dress worth $10,000 and the man's just finished his education, in most cases, the man is still in education, how then is a man supposed to have the financial ability to get married in a, in a permanent marriage? So he says, this is one of the reasons for why uh, a fixed time marriage is... Uh, is uh, relevant in today's day and age. And then he gives reasons as to why again, and he says that uh, an individual is left with the two uh, possibilities. The first one is that you either perform sexual acts with many men or women, or you commit yourself to a woman or a man without taking responsibility. I know that is not the wisest thing, not taking responsibility, but uh, he argues this out as well, and uh, he says that uh, uh, the responsibility of marriage is great, and the Financial burden may be a bit high. However, this is not the only thing that he favors. He, he, he does justice to the topic and he talks about the faults and evils of fixed time marriages. And uh, he mentions uh, three of them. The first one he says is uh, no future commitments from the men. And he says that uh, in a situation where the men are just used to performing uh, fixed time marriages, it leads to a situation where the men don't want to be now uh, committed into establishing a relationship even when they can. And then he says the other, uh, the other downfall to fix our marriage is that it's below the human dignity of a woman. Uh, there's some, uh, it's something interesting that Atala Mutahari says that uh, the below the dignity of a woman, he says that it's like you're hiring a woman and you pay her just to, uh, uh, just to get some benefits from her. But he, he argues his point and he says that uh, since when has the practice of hiring human beings been abolished? All the tailors, barbers, cooks, even specialists, all government employees, and from the prime minister to the lower official, all factory workers are all hired individuals. Not to say that women should be hired, but he's just trying to say if it's in a situation where it's, there is a, an established uh, relationship, then you shouldn't look at it in such a way that it's a woman being hired for a service. Because at the end of the day, all professions are being hired. That's the argument he puts forward. It's for you to think about. And then uh, the other reason he says is that it leaves uh, children uh, shelterless. And he says that, for example, if there was a, a, a birth of a child in that situation, it leads to a situation where now the children were shelterless. And he explains this point and he says, however, with today's day and age and technology, the woman can take certain precautions and the men can take certain precautions that don't lead to children being uh, born into this world. So he's established uh, these three points and then the last one that he analyzes is uh, polygamy. We talked about polygamy two weeks ago. Uh, Brother Mahdi did us justice and he explained the topic well enough. And it raised many questions. I, I thought a few of the questions we left unanswered. It didn't leave the women very much pleased about the topic. Inshallah, today's topic has made them smile a bit. However, he talks about polygamy and he says, why is polygamy accept acceptable in today's day and age? And uh, he gives only two reasons when he feels that polygamy should be practiced. Just two reasons only, which I found really interesting. And the first one he says is because polygamy should be practiced in the situation where the sterility of the first wife is, uh, is, uh, is low. He says, for example, in a situation where a man wants to give birth to children and he wants to have a family, but the wife is unable to have uh, children. Then he says in that instance, having another wife for the sake of promoting uh, humanity and for the sake of having more uh, the followers of the Mahdi, he says this is when the, the, uh, the possibility of marrying a second wife is feasible. And then he gives another example and he says the numerical superiority. Uh, he says men are, uh, men are more prone to dying because of illnesses and because of war. Men, if you see statistically, men are, when it comes to illnesses, men are more prone to dying because of illnesses than women are. So it leads to a situation where uh, there's uh, loads of women and less men. Or for example through war where there's more men going into war and uh, men lose their lives and when they come back the wives are widowed. So it leads to a situation where the women need to be protected. So it says because of numerical superiority it can lead to a situation where uh, the men is permissible to have more than one wife. However, he doesn't stop there. He talks about the drawbacks and the defects of polygamy. He gives two reasons for when it's permissible, but he gives so many reasons about the drawbacks. I don't know. This is just my opinion. I may be wrong. I don't want to be held liable. But in my view, I feel that because he's given so many conditions and drawbacks to it, it's of his opinion that it's not really something that we should practice unless you've met the criteria. And he gives uh, certain drawbacks and certain criteria that need to be met. 
the first drawback that he says is uh, the psychological one and he says that when you have two wives you can you can't really share both the love between both wives so he says it's it's not practical to love both your wives equally so he says because of that it's unfair to the first wife that you marry a second because you wouldn't be doing her justice when it comes to the emotional support and showing her love and then he talks about the second reason and he talks about the behavior naturally women we last week we said that women are jealous men are jealous too i mean trust me men are jealous too but women are, are jealous and it leads to a situation for example if two women were uh, well, what well, to be in the same family? There would be jealousy between them, and they would hate one another. And be like, oh, that wife, oh, that wife. You know the standard women argument that you may have. So he gives the behavior, and he says that because the women may have this argument, it leads, it, it deteriorates even further, and it leads on to the children. Well, this will be like, oh, that's that mom's child. Oh, that, that's that, that's my brother, but eh, that's my brother from that one, you know. So it's like you know, it leads to that situation where there is no. It creates a family of chaos. There is no real justice and there's no really happiness into the family however he's, he explains this point and he says this can be uh, tackled if you have a situation where uh, the husband explains to both the wives and he tries to create that unity and then he talks about the legal consent of uh, the first wife this is again something that differ with jurists as we saw last week but in the eyes of Ayatollah Mutahari he says that for a man to marry a second wife, the consent of the first wife is important. So a man cannot go and marry a second wife unless the first wife has given him consent to marry the second wife. This again I said is a matter that differs with jurists, but according to Mutahari, this is his opinion. And then he talks about the, the, the conditions that need to be upheld for uh, polygamy to be acceptable. And the first one he gives is the issue of equal treatment. He says that, uh, he gives a beautiful explanation, give me a second, he says that uh, uh, he, to explain this point, he says, according to Islamic law, if a man apprehends that the use of water may be harmful to him, he should not perform ablution for prayers. Or, for example, if he apprehends that fasting may be har harmful to him, he should not keep fast. This is just to show that if something is harmful to you, you do not keep it. You do not perform that act. And this is how he explains this point. And he says, if you fear, if you fear, the word here is only fear. It doesn't say if you do. It says if you fear in the Holy Quran. He says, if you fear that you will not do justice to, the, to both wives, then only have one. This is just to show that we saw if you if wudu is harmful for you, then you do not perform it. If fasting is harmful for you, you do not perform it. So the same way, if you fear that you will not do justice to them, you should abstain from it. So this is how he explains the point of equal treatment. And then he comes to the next point of, uh, uh, of uh, justice. And he says that, uh, he gives a nice hadith where he says that uh, on the day of judgment, uh, the man who's not done justice, uh, the, no, 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 the man who's favored one wife, sorry, not justice, favored. The man who's favored one wife over the other on the day of judgment will be raised with one side of his body dragging along the ground. He will eventually go to his end aboard his hell. Which is trying to say that the import, you can't favor when it comes to the issue of marriage. If you have to favor one wife over the other, then you cannot have, that, uh, you cannot have the practice of polygamy. So there should be justice, there should be equal treatment, there should be no favoritism, there should be legal consent of the first wife. They should, they, these are enough conditions just to say that, hello brothers, you can't really do it. It's, it's impractical to have a situation where you can actually have justice between both of the wives. Not to say that you can't, and that's the reason for why he says that uh, it is something permissible in the religion of Islam, but that is for the men who've reached certain high levels that they can, they can actually do justice. Or it's, uh, it, uh, for certain women who actually find that it is, it, I should actually let my husband marry another woman because there's plenty of women in the world who want to be into a relationship and need, need the care and love of a man. But this is really an idea, it's a bit, not in today's world, I don't think so, but it may be the day one day because the Quran is a day, is a Quran for, from the day what it came into existence till the day of judgment, it can't exclude certain things and therefore it is established in the religion for these reasons and these are the the conditions that you need to keep with and uh, the conclusion to uh, polygamy is that it becomes a duty instead of being a means of pursuit of pleasure so therefore we've realized that Islam the religion of Islam views women and men to be equal but not similar in nature and that through uh, nature itself men and women are uh, different and we analyze them that women need the protection of the men We've analyzed that uh, women had high statuses in the religion and we've said that for there to be a perfect family environment, the rights have to differ so that it's the responsibility of the men to perform certain tasks 
and the responsibility of a woman to perform certain tasks so that they can be some form of family establishment and family happiness. And then we talked about the questions that he addresses and he addresses uh, divorce and inheritance and polygamy, fixed time marriages. And with that, I've come to say uh, thank you for listening and that's the end of the presentation. Uh, just before your questions start, uh, I should have done this in the very beginning. <laughs> Uh, you must have read my name Mushtaba Jafar, but I'm no scholar by any means. I'm actually uh, an exchange student from the UK and I studied law in the UK. I've just come here to do a few policy courses. So I'm no scholar by, uh, by uh, profession. So some of your questions may be a bit challenging to me. Inshallah, there'll be a brother or a sister from the crowd who will be, be able to help us tackle them. If not, I'll take it upon me, inshallah, to find this answer for you and get back to you, inshallah. That has come to end wa akhir da'wan and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allah salli ala.